So, so it is our special, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I am the ugly, if you didn't know. It's a special because this is our first road show. It's Cyprus Comedy Central, and I thank you. So, I was born in the 70s. Anybody else born in the 70s? <laughs> Shut up, I know you were. <laughs> 60s. Okay. Alright, so the 70s was a very special time. It was a time of survival, and that's why that song was playing. And if you weren't born in the 70s, I'm going to tell you about it. It was survival. A survival of the fittest, and I'm here, and I'm one of them. I may not look it, but I survived, and I'm fit. When we were growing up, we didn't have covers on the sockets. So at any time, I could stick a fork in the socket and electrocute myself. It was that simple. I didn't do it, obviously. When we were growing up in the 70s, the adults would smoke in the same room as us. And the reason for that was, kids were very replaceable back then. Just pop that, another one. We also travelled in cars with no seatbelts, which was freaking awesome. We sat in the car however we wanted to, and I loved it. But I took it another step forward. And I used to sit on my dad's lap. Now my dad, he was a goat herder when he came from Greece. He was really good with his feet. So I would steer and change gears. None of this automatic shit. So he would be guiding me and telling me what to do. And I knew. And of course he got mixed up one day. And we crashed. So I was a bad sheep, goat, whatever, and I was obviously the black sheep of the family goat, and we parted ways, and that was our relationship from there on. But that's, that's neither here nor there. The 70s was great though, okay, great music, we had Gloria Gaynor, we had Led Zeppelin, we had, we had all the greats, okay, we had the Bee Gees. <laughs> <laughs> and all of the greats. But we also had our fashion, okay? Which I'm going to explain to you how I thought, or I think, came about. So, the way I think it happened. Designers, two of them, had to, obviously, present it to the board, had their design ready, went out, got completely shit-faced, drugs, drink, everything, didn't realise the time, rushed back, saw their design, thought this is great, they got the munchies though, and everything, and then obviously they puked all over it, they're like, oh, well, shit, we've got to go with this, rushed to the board, everyone in the board was off their freaking face too, looked at, the, looked at it, saw the colours and thought, whoa, this is cool. And so that's why we ended up with purples and oranges and greens and oranges, everything. So uh, that's why all the colours were really fucked up in the 70s. But that's okay. We went through that and it's alright. The other thing we had in the 70s, if anyone was here from there, was AIDS. Yes, we did. We had AIDS in the 70s, and we loved it. We loved AIDS. We craved AIDS, all right? We would go looking for AIDS in every room, right? We were looking for AIDS in the bedrooms, in the kitchen, in the front room, and the adults would not give us AIDS. Selfish bastards. <laughs> and, and everybody knew who had AIDS, and I'll tell you why. Because they would be skinny. 
And I, and I know you're confused right now, but it's alright, just stick with me and I'll explain it. They'll be like, have you got AIDS? And they'll be like, oh yes I do. And they'll be like, what AIDS do you have? Because there was different kind of AIDS. But like, I've got chocolate AIDS. <laughs> and they're like, oh, what do they taste like? And they're like, well I've got vanilla AIDS. And they're like, ha ha, you got vanilla AIDS. I tried them, I didn't like them AIDS. But I like got chocolate mint AIDS too. And they were nice. These AIDS, called AYDS, but pronounced AIDS, were little sweets that you used to eat to make you lose weight. <laughs> and these are real things. Real things. And we wanted AIDS as kids. We wanted it. We were asking, Mom, can I have some AIDS? And we were like, no, these are my AIDS and you're not having my AIDS. They were like, Auntie, can I have some of your AIDS? They were like, no, they're my AIDS. And everybody knew everybody had AIDS. And they were great. I loved AIDS. And then what happens? AIDS. Some scientist sitting in, in his lab finds this disease. I bet in his, in his high as well. Looks at the list. Ooh. Makes you lose weight. I wonder what we're going to call it. <laughs> AIDS. All of a sudden, everyone doesn't want AIDS. Ooh, terrible disease. Let's call it AIDS. Now, nobody wants AIDS. Excuse me, do you have some AIDS? No, I don't have no AIDS. But you've lost some weight. I know you've got AIDS. No, I don't have no AIDS. Nobody wants to buy AIDS no more. But I still want AIDS. I still want it. The mint chocolate ones were so delicious. Please give me some AIDS. Please. But nobody would give me AIDS. Because nobody wants them kind of AIDS. But there you go. That is AIDS. But if anybody's got um, little candy AIDS, but not the bad AIDS, let me know. <laughs> the other thing we did growing up, we knew how to fix things. Okay, we never called no repairman out. There was a special way of fixing things. So, if the TV was broken or the radio was broken, you would, there was a special way of fixing things, right? So you go up. Look at it, because everything had knobs on it. Let's just skip that bit. Anyway, so everything had knobs on it. <laughs> anyway, so you would fiddle with the knobs. Oh, that just sounds a bit weird. Anyway, so you, yeah, okay, something like that. Fiddle with knobs and whatever. And then if it didn't work, fiddling with knobs, usually it does work with some things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if the fiddling with knobs doesn't work, and you can do this with other things too, <laughs> you would give it a good whack. That works too. <laughs> All right. uh, uh, so that normally works and makes things work. And we would apply the whack to children too, because that would always <laughs> put them in their place. Uh, and it was great, because we knew, as children, because when they would give you a whack, we would, they wouldn't fiddle with your knobs. I don't know. Some of you may have had your knobs fiddled. I don't know. And actually, I don't want to know, okay? They would say to you, it's because I love you that I'm doing this to you. Because <laughs> if I didn't love you, I wouldn't care. So you would get beaten. <laughs> and then obviously if it was very bad, the whole family would get involved with that too. So, you know, if you didn't get beaten, you weren't loved. And you would just be left, obviously, with some trouble eating you up or something. So that's how we would be in the, in the, in when I was growing up in the 70s. <clears throat> Great times. <laughs> So, the other thing that we had were awesome playgrounds. 
Now, it was none of this pussy blade plans that you guys have, the sponges and safety stuff. Our floors were covered with gravel, okay? So when we fell, we would be skinned, okay? Our skin would be flayed off, hanging, okay? And we'd have big, nasty scabs. And the bigger it was, the bigger badge it was. It was great. So we're like, oh, look at mine, it's massive. And we'd sit there and I'd compare them, no, oh, mine's bigger. So that's what our grounds were covered with. So if we fell, because it was survival of the fittest, okay? We had to survive, it was survival. That's what it was all about. And the slides that we had were metal, hot metal, obviously the sun, baking. And we'd slide down and we wouldn't say a thing. You'd wait and watch your mates and see when they got third degree burns, if they'd say anything. And if they did, you'd take the liver piss out of them. Because that's what it was all about. And when we sat on the swings, we pushed higher. We went, oh no, please don't go higher. We pushed each other to go higher because we wanted to see that person go 360 degrees. We wanted to go 360 degrees. We wanted to be that hero because we were survivors. That's what we were. We pushed the limits because we were scared. In fact, when you heard about the guy who would, you know, kids would go in and never come out, I think the word is called heat the farm now or something like that. We never knew the word back then. And the kids would go in and never come out. We would dare each other to knock on the door to see if it was true. And then we'd run away. Just wanted to make sure. I swear. None of those paedophiles ever had a moment's silence ever again. It was great, because we would challenge ourselves. We wanted to see it real time. That's it. If I haven't already told you, I was an only child for the first 10 months of my life. <laughs> And then my sister was born. It was, a, it, was, it was a bit complex in forming. I thought she was a dolly. So I treated her accordingly, like I did the other dolls. And I tried to rip off her arms and her legs and it wouldn't come off. And of course I always got into trouble. So, I found other uses for her, as you do. So I would get her to do things first. So I convinced her, obviously, if I wanted an ice cream or a chocolate, I'd convince her that she wanted one. And it worked. It was great. So if I wanted to cut my hair, I cut hers. And that worked too. And then it came to the time when I wanted to shave my legs. I thought, I'd shave hers. Awesome. And then I watched the bath fill up with blood. <laughs> And I thought, yeah, you know what? I better not leave it. Save that for another time. And then it got a bit awkward later on, and I thought, you know what, this has got to stop. And it, especially when I got my first boyfriend, and he leaned in for a kiss, and I called her name, things got weird. So, so you know, that had to stop. And, you know, back then you never told a responsible adult on each other. We lost a lot of good friends that way. Bless them. <laughs> Bless them. I'm going to tell you uh, another, another reason why. And, um, you know, you have an idea about my dad. He was a shepherd and he was very random. Okay? So, he, uh, uh, I'm going to give you an idea. So, imagine a leaf. Okay, so this is, this is the only way I can describe my dad. So there's a leaf and it's flowing in the wind, just randomly blowing, and then it lands in your lap, and that leaf just pulls a switchblade out. 
So that's how random and strange my dad is. So you get an idea about my dad. So one day, I was having an argument with my friend Terry. So we're arguing, and it gets a bit heated, and everyone is around us, and he goes, I'm going to go and get my dad. So you realise, I was left with no choice. I had to do something. So I was like, all right, I'm going to get my dad. Bad choice. But anyway, I did. When I got my dad, and we went back to the place, and everyone was like, fight, fight, fight. And I was like, OK. So I'm back in the place with my dad, and I see my mate Terry coming towards me. And behind him, there's a person coming, big person. And I'm like, oh, dad. And he's like, don't worry. And I'm like, okay. So I'm hyped. And I'm excited, because the big fight's going to come down. I know my dad's going to mash them. So I see my friend Terry. He's really close. And then I see a woman in dungarees. And I'm like, ha, 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 ain't got that. <laughs> so I've got to imagine now I'm going to just cuss into the ground. I'm like, Terry, where's your dad? Where's your dad? And he just looks at me and he goes, that is my dad. I look at my dad, my dad looks at me, pushes me out of the way, I'm like, oh she, what is going on? My whole brain is just exploding. Terry's looking at me and thinking, what's wrong with you? That's my dad, idiot. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. My whole universe is just exploding. And my dad goes, and so this is exactly it. You stupid girl! Get out of my way before I kick you on my feet, smell like fish! And then my dad just goes, and I'm left standing there with Terry and his woman dad. <laughs> and I realized that is the first and last time I ask any of my parents to help. <laughs> The next time, whoever comes, I'll kick their ass by myself. It doesn't matter. That is it. So, oh, that was the last time I ever told my dad or involved him in any of my conversations with my friends. But you live and learn, right? I'm here, I'm a survivor, and that's what I am. My mum, bless her, she's quite the motivational speaker. So she would always tell me, if you start something, if you start a job, you have to finish it. And she would always demonstrate that for us. So she told us to come up and get here. We had to do it. So if she called me, I would go. Otherwise she'd get up, because I made her get up, and slap me. Because that's what mothers do, right? So you have to do it. The other thing my mum taught us was to be fearless. And how did she teach us that? She taught us by watching horror movies. Now she, as she watched us, as she watched us, and she made us watch these films, and she was telling us that, yeah, this is a reality. This is this is fake. Don't worry about it. So we watched young women being drained of blood, and cars being possessed. And she was telling us, don't be scared, it's fine. She failed, because I hate them. But she did give me a great imagination, and that I thank her for. And I used that imagination on my sister, which was great fun. <laughs> so we had a couple of teddy bears, and I would Color her teddy bear's legging with red blood. And I would tell her, I'm sorry, your teddy bear's bleeding out. <laughs> it's dying. And we need to save it. So we'd use rolls and rolls of toilet paper trying to save the teddy bear. And I would just dab, 
the red pen and say, it's bleeding out, we need more. <laughs> so it would be going great until one day my mum was caught short on the toilet. Then she got mad that we were wasting all the toilet paper. So I said to my sister, you know what, I'm really sorry, but your teddy bear is dead. <laughs> so I taught her the harsh realities of life and death, which was okay. She accepted that she cried for a few hours, but yeah, you know, I helped her. Harsh realities, right? The other thing my mum taught us was sign language. But not the kind of sign language you think. I don't know if anybody else knows this language, but it's eyebrow sign language. So we knew exactly what we could do and what we couldn't do by eyebrows. So we would be out and people would be like, would you like something to eat? And I'd look at my mum and she'd be like, And we knew whether we could or we couldn't. And then we oh my god, your children are so well behaved. And me and my sister would be like, holy shit, can you not see what she's doing? Her eyebrows are moving. Look at her. And then it'd be like the dreaded, when I get you home, you're dead. <laughs> but she was great. And you have to realise, this was the 70s. This pencil thing, fucking eyebrows. <laughs> this is a skill, skill, guys. They were traumatized. <laughs> eyebrows. I see the big ones now. I'm like, holy shit! How do they communicate with each other? The other thing my mum taught us was to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. And she did it so well that other adults entrusted me with their youngsters. And it was awesome. Remember, it was the 70s and, you know, it, I was part of the survival. So, uh, I enjoyed it. So I had responsibility and I looked after the young children. At one time, there was a party going on, and I was super excited because I had a t-shirt that had lights on, and I wanted to join in because I wanted to show my moves on. It was so great. And the lights were flashing, and I wanted to be with the adults because I was eight years old, and I was such an adult. But they were like, no, you need to look after the youngsters. So I was like, okay, I will fix this. So I went into the room and we played hide and seek. Wow, okay, hide and seek for me was locking them in the wardrobe for half an hour until they screamed to come out. But nevertheless, they were hiding and then I seek them. It was okay. But I wasn't allowed to join until they fell asleep. So, in my mind, I knew how to do that. I have to say, Little children and beer. Oh, it was great. I was in there in 10 minutes. It was awesome. I had fun. And I could show my stuff off. My mum also uh, taught us how to be creative. And how to be creative was nothing cannot be used as a weapon. Alright? If it's not Bolt it down, you can use it as a missile. And it's great. So, and you just use your imagination and just pick it up and throw it. And I use it till today. And I think you just need to expand your minds. Okay? So just use that. Anyway, you've been great. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> The next time we this evening is Florin. Okay? A big round of applause for Florin this evening. Thank you. Please give another round of applause of ah, sorry. Please give another round of applause to Irene. She organized everything. Thank you. 
Okay, 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 okay. Calm the fuck down. I'm the talent here. <laughs> yeah, so, um, like I mean, said, my name is Florian. I'm from Romania. Please don't leave. Your wallets will still be in your pockets at the end of the show. Most of you. <laughs> I could see some of you when you heard Romania, the R word, you were ready to jump out the window. One guy in the back was triggered. He was like, you're not getting me again, motherfucker. It happens. It's a horrible stereotype that Romanians get, and it's 100% true. We will rob you. And your problem is when you hear Romanian, your first instinct is to do this. It's like, where's my wallet? Where's my phone? And that's a rookie mistake, my friends. You never do that. When you hear Romanian or you hear Romanians talking around you and you reach for your wallet or your phone, what you're telling me is, that's where that dumbass's wallet is. I don't need to search the rest of his body. So, as a tip, if nothing else tonight, you'll get a good tip. When you hear Romanians talking around you, just pretend to sneeze. And you're like, ah, where's that fucking handkerchief I have? Hold on. I knew they had a handkerchief somewhere. Yeah. So, like I said, I'm Romanian and the best part about it is when I travel, I meet different people and they have different reactions based on the culture. Um, they have different reactions to what I, to when they hear it. So quite recently, actually here in Cyprus, um, a gentleman, he asked me where am I from and I told him I'm from Romania and he was like, oh, that is not possible, my friend. You are so intelligent. <laughs> Thank you. I guess. What can I say? Yeah, so um, I grew up in... Uh, I, I, sorry, before I get to that. I recently, because this is the big news, I recently got back from France. I was on vacation there and it was fucking amazing. And the best part about France is the, is the atmosphere the French create. And I enjoyed it so much and there was so much to see that I took hundreds and hundreds of pictures and yes, I know what you're all thinking, I did bring all of them with me and we are going to show them now. Absolutely, we've got like 800 pictures, roll them! No? You would rather take a sledgehammer to the dick than sit through that? That's the natural response, my friends. When somebody tells you, invites you over to their house, tells you, I just came back from vacation, and then sits you down for five hours of torture. Because that's what it is. Those of you in the audience who do this to your friends, I want you to know, in my opinion, you are the worst people on the fucking planet. I genuinely think that. Because... It's... It's not that you kill people, you torture them. Nobody, no amount of keychains is worth the aggravation you put us through. When we're sitting there and you're just going on and on like, this is me, look at the pyramids. Yes, I can see the fucking pyramids. Oh, I can tell that's the Sahara, yes, it has so much sand. What's that? Oh my God, they have a McDonald's? That's how we fucking feel all the time. And you're sitting there, and it's our fault, honestly, because we should be honest with you and tell you the truth. But we don't, because we want to be good friends. So we sit through hours and hours of this. Well, let me tell you, I stopped doing this. This year, when I went back home, and somebody sat me down, and they're like, let me show you my pictures of Fiji. I was like, nobody gives a fuck about Fiji, mom. We haven't spoken a lot, but I feel like I, I've accomplished something and I feel five hours younger. Now, speaking of friends, as I said, I was there, I absolutely enjoyed it. I thought it was a fantastic city. I enjoyed it so much because it's such a mixture of uh, not just smells and music and but cultures. 
Like you would sit down at a cafe and you would just hear people talking around you and you would try to guess where all the different people are from. But there was one group of people, one particular nationality that I never had any problems identifying. And I want to try and recreate that experience for all of you now because I, I, these people absolutely ruined my vacation and I want to make sure you understand the pain I went through. So, in order to visualize it, I want you all to just close your eyes and I'll try to paint a picture, okay? Close your eyes. Yes, you've got your eyes closed, perfect. George, take their wallets. You don't close your eyes in front of a Romanian, rookie mistake, you're learning, you're, no, 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 you're learning, it's fine, it's fine. So yeah, so try to imagine you're in Paris, right? You've just sat down at a wonderful cafe, you're by the, I don't know, Seine, what river do they have there? I think it's the Seine, yeah. So you sat by the Seine, you're, you're looking down in the distance, you see Notre Dame, you're, you've ordered your coffee and your croissant, because that's how you pronounce it over there. And you look across the street and up on the river Seine you can see these little boutiques and there are artists starving of course while you're eating in front of them. And there's starving artists trying to sell their stuff and you're just listening and you can hear Spanish and you're wondering where are these people from? Are they from Argentina, Spain, Colombia? You don't know. You hear some I don't know, Viking talk, who the fuck knows what they're saying. Are they Dutch? Are they German? Are they Norwegian? You don't know. And then as you're enjoying all of that, all of a sudden you hear, Hey, Bob! 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 Oh my God, man, that, sh that place must have shit food. It's called a crappery. Okay, okay, shh. Try to relax. Listen to the jazz. Listen to the jazz. There's a, what's that? That's the, the smell of lavender in the air. You're trying to enjoy it, ignoring them, ignoring them. And then you hear, hey Cindy, oh my god girl, that's such a beautiful dress. And the purse, oh my god, it fits your aura. <laughs> Jennifer, thank you so much, it does. My aura is extra pink today. <laughs> yes. I am talking about Americans, if you haven't guessed it yet. And I don't know if there are any Americans joining us tonight, but if any of you are out there, or if by some miracle this gets put on Facebook or YouTube, I know I joke around a lot, but I fucking hate you people. <laughs> like, you've ruined it for me. I was enjoying friends, but you've ruined it. You really have. And not enough people tell you this. Like, I know, you're gonna say, but Florine, who are you to fucking judge us? Your people rob us. And I'm gonna be like, yes, we will steal from you, but at least we have the goddamn common courtesy to do so in silence. <laughs> I'm not gonna ruin, I'm gonna ruin your vacation, but in different ways. So, and look, guys, we have to address the elephant in the room, and that is, well, the problem, the real problem here is that we are encouraging the Americans, and I think it needs to stop. We have been, we have, we've tried to be good neighbors with them, and we need to acknowledge the fact that the U.S. has had an identity crisis for the last 70 years, and none of us have told them the truth. We've went along with it because like the good friends we are, when we see one of our friends, you know, he's a drug addict or whatever, we were like, he's gonna get his shit together, right? He's gonna get his shit together. He has problems, man. He, he went through stuff. He's gonna get his shit together. And that's how we've been with the US. We've been like, no, 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 they're gonna get their shit together. But if you think about it, ever since World War II, all the Americans have ever done is fucking fight with the Russians. <laughs> like, World War II happened, they were best friends with Russia. They defeated Hitler together, they were like the hot couple, right? 
everybody thought, man, they're like Beyonce and what's his face? <laughs> they're gonna be unstoppable, right? But no. What happened was Russia was became the USSR, or it was the USSR before that, who the fuck knows? And all of a sudden the US felt attacked. It was like, oh, you betrayed me. The way the Americans usually do. And they got into this really long divorce with Russia and they got all their friends and family involved, as you do in a nasty divorce, right? You, some of you look like you've been through nasty divorces. I could see some dead eyes over here. That person looks like he lost his house. So, I can tell that, that you understand what a nasty divorce is like. And that's what it's been like for the Americans. They went through this really nasty divorce. And then we, as their friends, we, we went to Russia and the US and we were like, guys, 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 come on. You can fix this. And they're like, no. No, we can't fix this. We're like, come on, come on. Maybe get your shit together. And then, you know, the Cuban Missile Crisis happened. They nearly killed us all. But still, we believed. Deep down, we believed that they would get their shit together. And then finally, the USSR disbanded, what was it, 91? And we were all finally like, ah, oh, we can breathe again. They're not gonna kill us all, right? They finally fixed whatever problems they had, and now the US is finally gonna get its shit together. And then not even 10 years later, 9-11 happened. And we were like, ah, fuck. They're gonna be unbearable assholes now. And they were. Because before, there was 40 years of, guys, guys, but communists, right? 40 years of, guys, guys, I know, but communists. And they went from that to, guys, guys, but terrorists. Okay, we agree that the terrorists are bad, but maybe you can clean up some of your shit because it's spilling over on our side of the apartment and global warming. <laughs> and the US was like, no, 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 but, but terrorists, yes, but we're very sorry for 9-11, but 2,300 people died in 9-11 while global warming threatens the entire human race? <laughs> Apples and oranges, but still, maybe get your shit together. And then finally, finally, they elected Obama and we were like, yes, change, motherfucker. They elected the black guy president, everything's gonna be different. Was it? Maybe, maybe he did do some small changes. But the last time I checked, in the White House, there's an overcooked potato with the emotional complex of a five-year-old. Yeah. So we need to stop lying to them. We need to tell them to get their shit together. But for real. Yeah. So enough about foreign countries. Let me tell you about Romania. Let me tell you about my family. So we were six kids who grew up in a house with two parents and one grandmother. So nine people in a house that was meant for four. If you have you ever opened a can of sardines? That's how we felt. Yes, but we were even more oily. Because we were Romanian, I don't know. Anyway, so um, our parents, what they did, many of you may be thinking, why the fuck did they have six kids? Are they super religious? They are not. In fact, fun fact, in Romania there was communism. I don't know if you knew that. And during communism, our fearless leader thought, you know what, Stalin had the whole, let's imprison all the doctors, and Hitler, well, Hitler do, did some things. I need a dumbass decree. So what he did, he 
banned all contraceptives. That meant condoms, pills, abortions, everything became illegal of that nature in Romania. And shit was, and TV was also shit at the time because it was nothing but stuff about Ceausescu. Books were censored and there was no Netflix. So, what my parents did was, you want to have sex? Yeah. Are you going to pull out? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that's how my sister was born. <laughs> the oldest. The first one. The miracle. That's how we call her. The miracle. The miracle, this is the thing about when you have six kids, when you have your first child, and some of you might be parents, when you have the first child, you're super protective of the first child. Because it's the first fucking child. You don't know what you're doing. By the way, my parents, my dad was 23 and my mom was 21 when my sister was born. So you can imagine the emotional maturity of these people. So when my sister was born, obviously they were overprotective. You know, to the point where it got to abuse. <laughs> they did it out of love. Like Irene said. <laughs> so, my parents with my first sister, they had to protect her. When my older brother Andrew, uh, you don't need to know his name, when my older brother got born, they were like, okay, okay, the first one didn't die that easily, so maybe we can ease up a bit. And they did, they eased up, they weren't so protective of him. And then when my other sister was born, they were like, okay, I think if we feed her and just put her in front of the TV, she's gonna be fine. <laughs> we'll hug her once in a while, you know? That should, you know, not make her become a stripper. <laughs> but when they got to me, at this point, they were like, I think if we give him food bucket, shit bucket, water bucket, and he doesn't mix them up, he should be good. <laughs> Here's a potato, have fun, champ. I don't even want to know what kind of education my younger brothers got. <laughs> In any case, so yeah, so the first child is always the miracle. And the second child is, well, the second child was the boy and you gotta love the boy. The third child, the third child was the unexpected mistake. And the fourth child, you think, maybe we should give him up for adoption. And you think that's a joke, but when I was 14, my grandmother, my grandmother, by the way, she's born, she's 95 years old. She was born in 1924. Yeah? She saw some shit in her life. Anyway, my grandmother, she had the weirdest understanding of how to raise children. She wanted us to love God, not swear, but she would tell us the most horrific fucking things we've ever heard. And I'll get to that a little bit later, but what the horrific thing she happened to tell me that specific day on my 14th birthday, she came up to me and she was like, oh Florian, happy birthday, you're fantastic, you're such a beautiful and talented child. I don't even know how your parents could ever consider giving you up for adoption. <laughs> and yeah, and I was like, I put down the birthday cake. The fuck did you just say, Grandma? No, I mean, okay, you know that we have some family friends, and you know that they couldn't have children. So, they told your parents that since they already had three, maybe they'd consider giving you up. And since I was the fourth one, and I knew I was the fourth one, my thought was like, did, did they not offer my parents anything? As like, I'm pretty sure if they would have given them a carton of cigarettes, they would have accepted. <laughs> but no carton of cigarettes was given, so I'm here today. Thank you. Going back to my grandmother and childhood traumas, since she was born in 1924, you have to imagine, if you think 70s, it's bad, <laughs> yes, 
1924, they had very different understandings of what it meant to be a parent. For one thing, it definitely didn't mean you can you ever need to tell your child you love them or you care for them or that they were even wanted at all. And my grandmother never got any of this. She was told some of the most horrific shit when she grew up. And since there were no therapists in Romania at the time for her to attend, like most of you are probably going through therapy, probably because of the divorces, I don't know. So since there was none of that, my grandmother, she turned to the only people near her who would listen to what she had to say because she had wisdom to impart. And those people were her grandchildren. So at the age of six, I found out a lot of interesting things about my grandmother. Like the fact that her house got bombed immediately during the war. Her entire family nearly died. Her parents told her she was an unwanted child and how they wished she was born uh, a boy. And I remember I was sitting in the fetal position in the corner crying and she was like, Why are you crying, you little bitch? I didn't even get to the good part yet. Be my therapist. Yeah. So that was my grandmother. And guys, you might think, oh, but you're judging her. I'm not. That, that's the way she grew up. I love her to death, but she seriously fucked me up. And so did my parents. And all of our parents really fuck us up. It's really the degrees. It's the different nuances, right? And it's okay. We love them anyway. We can't hate our parents to their faces. We have to be respectful when we go. But, you know, you live and learn. I guess, what can you do? You can't change people. And I found that out, well, I found that out also with my group of friends. Because I have seven friends back in Romania. One of them is in jail, not for what you think. He didn't rob anyone, he murdered someone. It's completely <laughs> different. Stop stereotyping us. So, um, one of my friends, he's super optimistic. He's the optimistic one of the bunch. He's the kind of guy who will post motivational quotes on Facebook, be like, isn't every day precious and the puppy's eyes are adorable and shit like that. So when I was last time in Romania, he decided to give us a motivational quote of the day. And he came to us and he was like, guys, every life is precious. Every single life on earth. Isn't life so precious? And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> And he was like, yes it is. No, it's really not. And I don't know where you came up with this ridiculous concept. He's like, dude, society deems all life precious. I'm like, okay, let's destroy this simpleton's idea. Trees. Trees are alive, yes. Yet I've never seen you once, or any of you here, uh, go and petition Ikea to close down. In fact, he, and a lot of you, probably have 30-year-old coffee tables in your living rooms from Ikea. So he was like, oh, okay, okay, so, okay, maybe not every single life. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All, so we'll say that all life is precious except life that is useful to us. Fair enough. What about bugs? <laughs> Last time I checked, bugs weren't precious. Okay, all life is precious unless it's useful or disgusting. What about chickens, cows, and pigs? I've never seen you once turn down a burger. And even your vegan friends eat vegetables and fruit and shit, so they're also killing life. So we'll say all life is precious unless it's useful, disgusting, or delicious. <laughs> Fine. But surely human life is precious. I mean, the defense budget is kind of spent on missiles, rockets, guns and shit. All meant to extinguish that precious resource that we call life. 
He's in therapy now, but in my defense, he shouldn't have opened that. Like, he sh you don't poke the bear, you know? You leave the bear to sleep. That's also what I call my dad, the bear. You don't poke the bear. One second. I've got a very dry mouth. Not because I've been talking, because I'm high. No, no, no. It's not what you think. I'll be driving back, it's fine. If the police stop me, what are they gonna be like? Yeah, my friend, it's good. You went over the speed limit. Speaking of... Speaking of... Uh, let me tell you a story that happened to me, and just so... Just to give you some context, I don't know if any of you can tell, but I work out. <laughs> Ladies. And um, what I do is I do a lot of rock climbing. And a lot of you are thinking, oh wow, rock climbing, that sounds like a dangerous sport. It is, but not for the reasons you might think. See, in rock climbing, what you do is when you go out and you climb on those really high rocks, you have a lot of equipment with you. You have harnesses and ropes and chalk for your fingers and somebody's there, you know, belaying you and shit. And all of this equipment that you take with you, it's meant to keep you safe. You know, you even have a helmet and shit, right? But when you go climbing, especially in Cyprus, if it rained all winter, before you can get to the rock, sometimes you'll have giant, thick, thorny, desert-like bushes in the way. I'm not saying Cyprus is a desert, but it sure fucking looks like one. <laughs> so, we get to the rocks, and it's covered in these big, thick bushes. I want to say kind of like my ex-girlfriend right now. <laughs> but I'm not gonna <laughs> calm the fuck down. So, we get to the rock. And we have a bunch of gardening equipment with us so we can fucking trim the bushes. And because I want to look fucking epic, I couldn't just bring a pair of scissors, you know, like gardening tools. No, I have to bring a fucking machete with me because I think it makes me look like a badass. So I'm like, and I'm not cutting shit, but it looks cool. And after about three hours of gardening, we finally managed to clear the path and we're finally climbing, and we managed to climb for a whole 10 minutes before it starts raining down with hail. So, we quickly get down, we grab all of our shit, we rush to the car, we throw it in the back seat, we throw all of our gardening equipment, we get in the car and we get the fuck out of there. And on our way back, I'm sleepy and tired as hell because I've just done three hours worth of gardening that could have been done in 10 minutes, but I did it in 3 hours with a fucking machete. And we're driving back, well I'm driving back, and my uh, climbing partner, she's sitting next to me, sleeping, she's like... Oh, bit of drool on the side of the face, you know, like... Oh, like an angel. <laughs> and I'm there, bloodshot eyes, driving, pinching myself to stay awake, and I'm pressing on the acceleration just thinking I need to get home fast if I drive faster it's safer because I get there quicker <laughs> I won't fall asleep at the wheel perfect logic anyway so I'm driving down this highway and of course I get stopped by the police because I'm driving with like 160 and I'm already like I'm so tired I'm not I don't even want to argue with the guy so I stop I put the window down, the police officer very politely says, good afternoon, sir. I go like, good afternoon, officer, what seems to be the problem? He goes like, eh, my friend, uh, it seems that you are going over 160. My friend, my friend, why, why don't you come out of the car? Come out of the car, we need to talk. And I'm sitting there like, fuck, he must think I'm drunk. Because I have bloodshot eyes, I'm tired as hell. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm gonna have to do this, you know? So I get out of the car, and instead of asking me to do this, his partner forces me on the car and starts patting me down, then forces me to the ground and starts handcuffing me. 
freaking the fuck out because nobody's ever done that to me for drinking or driving or both or speeding all of them doesn't matter so while this is happening to me and I'm freaking the fuck out I don't realize what the police officer is seeing because all I'm thinking is I'm sleepy and this motherfucker seems to feel the need to wake me up <laughs> and what's actually happening is the police officer is looking in my car and he's seeing a guy with bloodshot eyes at the wheel a passed out girl next to him they both have a mysterious white substance all over them in the back seat there's rope, a machete, and a shot. <laughs> so he's come to a conclusion. And that's not that I'm drunk. <laughs> now, obviously, because I'm being forced to the ground and handcuffed. Ah, by the way, while all of this is happening, She's still sleeping. While all of this is happening, she's still sleeping. I'm freaking the fuck out, so I shout at the guy, what the fuck is going on? Except, I don't say, what the fuck is going on? I say, Chipula Mesetumbla. Which is Romanian for what the fuck is going on. As soon as Chipula Mesetumbla happens, I feel a knee in my back and a gun at my head and the police officer goes I'm gonna blow this motherfucker away <laughs> at which point I start pissing myself and the other officer immediately reacts he goes like whoa 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 Andreas Andreas calm the fuck down and then starts talking to him in Cypriot Greek Greek he starts talking to him in Greek, and I don't know what the fuck's happening, because I don't speak Greek. I do understand one word though, and that word is form. Yes, form. Apparently what this nice police officer was trying to explain to the other police officer was that all the forms he would have to fill out if he shot me. <laughs> At which point, Andreas starts calming the fuck down. <laughs> And I feel like the knee sort of leaving my back. I feel the gun, you know, like no longer pressed against my temple. He hasn't holstered it yet, but it's a start. So while this is happening, finally my climbing partner, she wakes up. She sees what's happening. She starts freaking the fuck out, because what the fuck? So she gets out of the car. She starts screaming at the police officers. The police officers, immediately I feel the knee back in my uh, back and the gun pressed against my head and the police officer goes like You motherfucker, what did you give the poor girl? She's talking nonsense! And I'm on the ground looking up at him like It's Russian! It's Russian! <laughs> Needless to say They understood it was a small misunderstanding and the nice gentleman Andreas he was like eh, my friend uh, you know I didn't want you know it's not because you're Romanian it's because I thought you were a criminal <laughs> I'm good <laughs> thanks so yeah that was my uh, interaction with the Cypriot police one time it was fun, what can I say? We all learned something, and it's that don't stereotype people. Romanians might also be murderers. <laughs> anyway, guys, you've been lovely. I want to tell you one last joke before I go. Wait, 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 don't, don't, don't start clapping. This joke is, well, it's not really a joke. What I do is, I love coming up with commercial ideas. It's one of my pet peeves, you know what I mean. Yeah, it's one of my passions. So, what I've done is I've come up with a, what I consider to be a pretty good fucking commercial idea. And I want to sell this commercial idea, so I'm hoping you can all give me some feedback. So, 
the commercial idea I have is I'm envisioning Pepsi, but you guys can envision whatever soft drink you like. So, you see a beautiful woman in a red dress walking into a store. She walks up, she grabs a pack of tampons, she goes to the cashier to pay her for her tampons, and at the cashier, she notices next to it a bin with ice cold Pepsi. So she picks up a bottle of Pepsi and she looks at it and she looks at the tampons and she looks, she only brought exact change with her. So she can only get the tampons or the Pepsi. And the next scene, you see her walking out of the store. Big smile on her face, Pepsi in her hand, long trail of blood behind her. <laughs> and then you hear a voice going, Pepsi, it's bloody good. <laughs> Thank you all, you've been a fantastic audience. We are going to take a small break, 15 minutes. Get your smoke on and please welcome the next comedian who will be coming afterwards, which will be Alexis. Okay, stick around. Woo! Our next comic, get ready for Alexis, please. Woo! So thank you very much for coming. Give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. Good night. It is a joy for me to be performing here tonight. It is a joy because I come from Nicosia and I haven't lived here for seven years. I lived in Larnaca, then I live, now I live in Limassol. And you know in Limassol, they, well everywhere else actually, they call us Butter. You are aware of that. This is the word that they use. Budios. That's actually what it means, right? Budios. Butter. Fucking butter. Like you couldn't do better. Than that. That's the best you can do. That's it. That's it. You're, you're insulting me. Budio. You fucking budio. Budio. <laughs> but I still moved out there and got one of their women. So yeah, that worked out for me very well. Oh, and when I say their women, I don't mean Cypriots from Limassol, I mean Russians. Because <laughs> they've taken over, I don't know if you realize, they've pretty much taken over. There's like, I don't know, like 30,000 of them just walking down the street. Cypriots don't say a thing, they don't care. You know why they don't care? Because Russian women are cute, that's why they don't care. Okay, to key, to key, bring more, bring more. They have the exact same approach as they have to food. Us Cypriots, that when I said they say us Cypriots, it's like, uh, you're, you're okay, you need, yeah, bring more, bring more, bring, I will tell you, bring. And I now, based on my experience, I can have a full telephone conversation in Russian, fluent. Russian, with an authentic Russian, well, an authentic Hollywood Russian <laughs> accent, because I take my education from the movies, 100%. So, here is my Russian conversation. I have to sit down and pretend that I'm doing something illegal <laughs> for this accent to work. Sounds like this. Aloha. Da, print. Da. Da, da. Da, harasho, harasho. Paka, paka. How dark was that? 
Everything they sound, everything. In the beginning, when I met my girlfriend, I thought she was always angry at her friends. I didn't understand that this is just how people talk. They have a very austere way of speaking. It's like you see a woman walking down her, down the street with two children, and you know she looks all cute, summer dress, beautiful, blah, 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 and she's going like Davai, 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 and they're so angry. I don't know why they're so angry, you know. But it worked out for me very well. Now. I'm curious, because when I say these jokes, I need to know how many Russians do we have in the audience? Thank you, one person. <laughs> so I can pretty much say whatever I want. I can pretty much say whatever I want. Um, let's see, I'm curious, do we have Romanians? Hi guys, thank you very much for coming. Stay away from our wallet. All right, I know we have English people, right? Yes! For king and country. <laughs> I moved out at some point. I moved out to, uh, to London. And I stayed there for three years, like every good Cypriot from Nicosia. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember coming back from London, first time from my first summer break. And it was June, and it was cold. Because London, I don't know if you know, is the capital a fuck you weather of the world. It's like people are so happy when it's sunny in London. They go to the park, they get some summer's bee or whatever they like. Like, oh, it's so nice to know. Yes, of course. And the weather is like, yes, go to the park. <laughs> go to the park and start sunbathing. So I was very happy, so I was coming back to Cyprus. I like summer, I'm a beach bum, 100%. And I like the summer. So I decided to celebrate with the way that I was clothed. And the way that I was clothed was, I was in flip flops, a, a pair of shorts that doubled as a bathing suit, and a huge orange t-shirt, okay? Uh, I should probably mention at this point that I was a very big boy at that time. Now when I say very big, I mean, this is the after. <laughs> At the time, I weighed 145 kilos, which is 40 kilos more than I weigh now. Uh, well, I say 40, I lost 50, but like, pizzas are delicious, so... <laughs> so, I say 40, because that's a more realistic figure. And uh, I, I was coming back, and I, I was at Heathrow Airport, and I had my entire... The, room, as juvenile as it sounds, I was a student, and I had my entire room packed in two suitcases. And I had a backpack, and I was studying guitar, so I had a guitar on my shoulders, and I'm like rolling away with all these things, my belongings on my back like a snail, and I'm wearing this big orange t-shirt. And from a distance, if you saw me, I looked one of those balls that are in the sea. <laughs> So you know where to swim. I look like, from a distance, you have to imagine 145 kilos of orange, okay? And I walk up to this nice lady and she weighs my bags and she sees that they are above the weight limit and she goes, oh, overweight sticker, please. She puts the overweight sticker in one bag, weighs the other one, realizes that it's overweight as well, says, another overweight sticker, please takes the other overweight sticker, puts it in my other bag, and goes, you're a student, right? <laughs> yes. yes, I am. And uh, you're going back for the break, right? Yes, yes, I am, I am. Okay, well listen, we're not gonna, you're not gonna pay anything extra this time, but you should know that next time when you will be carrying this much extra weight, at this point I'm looking for an opening, because I want to make a joke, because I'm happy. And I know that in the airport, you're, you can't really joke about anything. <laughs> she goes, next time you're going to be carrying this extra weight, you will be fined. I said, okay, thank you. She goes, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Um, uh, I mean that right now, you are very overweight. 
and I just drop my smile. I have this big smile on my face, and I just drop it like this. <laughs> and I go, do you have some AIDS? I have a, a story with a Romanian friend. You know, I know we have Romanians, so I would like to share this story. I have a friend, his name is Nick. I love him to death. He's a great guy. And he's the most innocent Romanian in the world, which means he will tell you when you are in danger of being mugged by other Romanians. He's essentially a snitch. <laughs> he's turned on his own kind. <laughs> and uh, me and Nick. Uh, we were in Greece, in Athens. Not, not just me and Nick, that would be weird. I, I, I mean, there was a bunch of us, including myself and Nick. And I had bought my first iPhone 6 Plus, which was a big phone. And I had it in my back pocket. I had everything arranged. You know how you arrange your pockets and you know where everything is? So I had my phone in my back pocket. He goes, dude, you, you, you don't take the phone, like, put it somewhere else. I said, why? He goes, because people will steal it. I said, who's going to steal my phone? He goes, <laughs> I'm like, you, how are you going to steal my phone? It's in my pocket. I will feel you taking it out. He goes, no, you, you won't. Just, I said, really? Surprise me. And he goes, okay, walk. Walk. All right, I'm going to show you how this happened. This, the stupid chair is me. And my clever Romanian friend behind me, he just walks and goes like this. Oh, sorry, man. And he has my phone in his hand. And I'm like, how the fuck did you, how the, did you, I can feel this. He goes, it's a Romanian thing, you wouldn't understand. I said, dude, do you realize how racist that sounds? You can't just walk around and say it's a Romanian thing. He goes, I'm Romanian. I can say whatever the fuck I like about Romanians. <laughs> uh, you know, there's never any French guys. Any French guys, girls? Fr French guy, oh my god. Guys, please, round of applause. There's never any French people. Obviously, because they're in France, having fun, being French. <laughs> you know, they're, they're just, they're, come on. Everything they say sounds like a fucking statement. I love, it's my favorite accent in the world. Now I know that people, you know, have their own, it's my favorite accent in the world because everything they say sounds like a statement to me. It's like, ha ha ha. This is it. This sounds French, right? It's not French, but it sounds French. And they have a special kind of laughter, which I love. It's the, the, <laughs> kind of laughter. <laughs> it's my favorite thing in the world. I would love to have been French. But it takes a special type of Frenchman to survive here in Cyprus. It does, you know, because different cultures, right? I have a friend. One guy that I know in Limassol, he's French, he moved out to Cyprus, no idea why, no clue. And he's a special type of Frenchman as well. I mean, his name is Nicolas. And I don't remember ever seeing him really sober. I found him at a club the other day, and <laughs> he was with his girlfriend, I was with my uncle. Hey man, he was, hey, 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 hey. This is how he summons people. This is, this is a short, stabby, like, hey, hey, hey. This is how he summons people, okay? That's what I mean. Everything sounds like a statement. And I, and I uh, extend my arm to like, you know, cheers, man. And he does this to me, the French guy. He goes, <laughs> and I go, whoa. <laughs> what an elegant French man. And as I say this, before I finish my sentence, he goes, eh, I need to go take a piece. <laughs> Special type of French man. Special type of furniture. I couldn't see where he was looking at. I took a trip to Paris once with my friend. Oh my god, this is gonna sound gay as shit. With my friend George on Valentine's Day. No joke, no homo, no bullshit either. Okay? Our flight left 14th of February. You should have seen the people at the airport. Thank you, enjoy your flight. Enjoy Paris, motherfucker. <laughs> One day difference. You couldn't. Fucking... So.
So we go to Paris and we have, we're having a lot of fun. And you know how boys can be stupid between them, right? And they suck each other. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I am kidding. So you know how boys can be stupid with each other, and we're in the taxi, and uh, I say, where do we go now, George? And uh, George, by the way, is Bulgarian, his name is Georgi, and he gets checked twice at the airport. Uh, I said, where to now, George? And he goes, I don't know, and he wanted to make a joke about going to the prostitutes, right? He, he thought it would be funny to say that, and he thought, because in Greek the word is putanias, he thought that he, it would be funny if he made a French version of it and said, putain. Now what George didn't know is that that's actually how you say prostitutes in French. That's the word. So he goes, putain. And the taxi driver goes, putain. <laughs> I'm like, what? No, no. Dude, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Let's just speak English. Let's just speak English. Uh, it was great, it was great. We came back to Cyprus. Uh, by the way, I now work in the forex industry. Anybody else works in the forex industry? No one! Uh, no one? <laughs> just me on the, on the plane to hell then. Just me. Just me on the train to fucking hell. That's it. Um, I didn't always used to work in this industry. I did much more humble professions. I used to be the caretaker for an exotic, well, it's called a mini collection of exotic birds, okay? It is as shit as it sounds, okay? This is what I had to do. There was a big, there was a vast um, place, big land, and on that land there were like thousands of cages, and there were like little tiny birds up until like big macaw parrots, like, wah, wah, the fucking flying over you. Shut the fuck, Jumanji, what is this? <laughs> including four monkeys, I don't know what kind of bird that is, and uh, about 40, 45 swans. Now, I thought that I would love swans. Me and swans would get along just fine. I used to be a piano fan when I was a kid. I wanted to become a concert pianist, I wanted to. And Swan Lake, Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake was my favorite work of all time, so I was very, very excited to actually see a swan in real life. We don't get those in Cyprus. So I went, and I you know, was very excited about it. Uh, I said, hi, Mr. Swan, nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, the thing is, Disney lied to us all. And swans are dicks. And I'm not trying to be racist, but this was a black swan. And his swan lady had an egg. And he was feeling extra protective. So zero chance of this dude being nice to me. So I'm walking into his cage. I have to, because in order to feed the other swans, I had to go through his cage, and then there was a little door to the other cage, little door to the other cage, etc. And I walk into his cage, and I am holding this bucket of feed. But because he was super aggressive to me, and you have to understand, his beak is here. So, <laughs> I was very scared of me. So I was holding a broom, and I was pushing him back with a soft part, with a brush, right? And he was going, quack, quack, quack. And I was holding him back. And with the other one, I was holding the feed. And I'm going to the other cage, and I'm trying to. And one day I do this, and I'm, you know, Safe, safety first, my guard is up, and I feel no resistance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I turn, and he's standing right over there, just looking at me. Like a fucking rap star, like 50 cents. I'm like, great! I have succeeded. I have conditioned the swan. I am Pavlov. And as I'm thinking this, and I'm trying to open the next door, I hear this, and I turn, and it's going, and I'm like, oh, and he's coming at me full clip, like, and I see everything in slow motion at this point because I'm scared, and I'm holding my broom, and I go, oh, 
shit! And I, in my head, I hear, round one, fight! I'm like, oh, shit! <laughs> and this swan comes at me full clip like, and you've all played Tekken, I take it. You remember Eddie and Lei and all these guys? Lei was Chucky e. Chan, he used to do this with his head. So the swan goes all fucking lay on me, I'm like, Whoa! and he goes, Pow! and he breaks my broomstick in half. No joke, fucking true story. I wish I was making this shit up. <laughs> Uh, and I'm standing there going, Kah! oh my, and I'm throwing this stick in the air. This is like calculation now. And, the, 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 and I'm throwing it in the air to flip it so I don't hit him with the sharp side, okay? Because I'm not going down like this. <laughs> and this swan sees the opening and he goes, and comes at me and I go, finish him. What? And the swan goes, <laughs> Fatality. Alexis wins. And I'm like, Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Fuck it. Who's your And I'm thinking now, dude, you just killed a swan. How much is a swan? I wouldn't argue, like if someone told me it's twelve thousand dollars for something, like, twelve thousand makes sense. Twelve thousand dollars, and I'm thinking, Sh shit, oh my god, I need to, I need to figure out what to do now. I need to figure out what to do. And I get out of the cage, and I need to figure out what to do. And I'm standing next to this cage. The swan is right here. Okay, he looks like a little Danish pastry. <laughs> Not moving. I'm like, shit, is he breathing? And he goes, respawn. And he's looking at me like, whoa. And I go to the little storage room and I pick up a shovel this time. Because I'm not going down this way. I take the shovel because I need to get into the cage to take away my broomstick and the broom. I don't want to leave any evidence. I don't know if this swan is going to have like a bump. <laughs> I don't want people to know. Lose my fucking job. I'm like 20 years old, fresh out of the army. I want some money to go to Yandaba. What are you talking about? And I go in with a shovel, and the, the swan, you could see, it was like a UFC fighter, you know? He was like, he was dizzy, but he was still in the fight. He was like, quack, quack. And I'm holding him back with a shovel. I'm thinking the shovel is like this thick. No chance it's going to break it, right? Now, there's a reason I'm telling you the story. If you had come to my work that day, and that was the first thing you saw, like a guy shoveling a swan away, you'd have some fucking questions. You know, you'd have some questions. In 2019, that happens, that's it. That guy's going on Facebook, YouTube, he's fucked for life. He's entertainment, he's target practice for everyone that has had a shitty day and goes online at 8 o'clock in the evening and they see this big guy shoveling a swan over like, fuck off, fuck off! And they're like, I'll help you die! I hope you fucking die, you fucking disgrace of a human being! I hope your children burn in the night as they sleep and you die of cancer of the dick! Because <laughs> that's what people are like online. They're, they're not very nice. They're not very nice. Now, um, I wanted to talk about when I came back to Cyprus. I came back to Cyprus, uh, I, I didn't mention that when I went to London, I wanted to study electric guitar. I thought that would be a great career choice. I would go and study. So I came back and I joined a rock band, obviously. And uh, that band was called Playmore. We had a lot of fun. We played everywhere in Cyprus. It's not the same as everywhere by itself. <laughs> everywhere in Cyprus is a very specific uh, place. Uh, so we played everywhere and there was a bunch of things that we did and I was very happy about those things, you know? Like there's videos of me, you can see me on, if you write, play on YouTube right now, not right now, 
But I mean, later, you'll see me bouncing up and down at 145 kilos, like nothing, like, like little baby elephants, like little Dumbo trying to take off for the first time. Like, <laughs> that was me, I was so happy. And there was a bunch of things that we did that we thought looked very cool. One of them was wearing eyeliner. Why not? Works for Johnny Depp. Works for Jason Momoa. It's the same thing, right? So there's pictures of us, and you can see there was five of us, and you can see rocker with eyeliner, rocker with eyeliner, rocker with eyeliner, kung fu panda, <laughs> rocker with eyeliner. <laughs> but one of the things that I really, really liked uh, about our connection with the guys, again, no homo, but we're good friends. We used to like meet up and have a beer. That's something that every man should do once in a while. Meet up with your friends, have a beer, have a talk, share stories. As I said before, boys say shit to each other. They say stupid stuff to each other, okay? Well, you have to understand we're hardwired by nature. So we're talking now over some beers and, oh, you have to understand these conversations go from PG-13 to Porn hop, like that. No warning. So we're talking, we're exchanging like little stories. Oh, on Wednesday, uh, and then I came home and I slept. My friend Mike turns and goes, "I fucked a deaf chick once." <laughs> what? And he realizes how ridiculous what he said was. And he goes, I once had sex with a woman who had no hearing. <laughs> and we're trying to keep it low now because we don't want to scare him because he just said something very personal to us and I am sharing it with all of you. <laughs> Some friend I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And I go, and uh, how was she? He goes, uh, quiet. <laughs> Which I think is bullshit. I think it's a lie. I think my friend didn't want me imagining him having sex with a beautiful lady that sounded like this. <laughs> And if Forks doesn't send me to hell, this joke will. <laughs> I then decided, you know what, this life is fun, but what I really want to do is get my shit together, because I don't enjoy being so heavy anymore. So I had to like do a little research and uh, I found out what everybody knows, which is stop eating so much and start lifting some weights. And that's pretty much what I did for a long enough time to make a difference, right? What I didn't know is that when you're really big, you have all this estrogen. As a man, you have all this estrogen that makes you very confused and you're not sure how to deal with it because you're like, listen, you're really hot and I like you but I also like the notebook. And I think if you're a bird, I'm a bird. <laughs> so having lost all that weight and uh, my testosterone returning to normal levels, maybe a little bit higher, uh, I started getting all these manly instincts. What happened is I hit puberty at 35. <laughs> and I started getting all these manly instincts without realizing where they're coming from or when they would strike. Like the other time, uh, we were going on a romantic walk with my girlfriend on the beach. Now, we live in Limassol, the beach is across the street, so we can't be telling you that it's a romantic walk every time we go to the beach. <laughs> it's, we were walking down the beach, it was a nice night, it was quiet, it was just me and her, we're walking down the beach. And this, there's a jogger behind me, and I didn't hear him, because he didn't make the protocol noise. There's a protocol noise, it's called a choo-choo train. And it sounds like this. That's how people jog, right? So when he passes by, he sounds like the Doppler effect. He's like, 
And that's how you know that there's a jogger and that you're fine. It's kind of like the Cypriot Doppler effect. You might know it when you're on the highway and you, someone wants to like take you over and you don't realize fast enough and they get super pissed off, but then you don't mean any harm, so you just pull left and they just pass by and they go, MASU! <laughs> that's what the protocol noise is there. He didn't make any noise. He was just holding it in. I don't know why. He was embarrassed. I don't know. He was like, <laughs> like a little baby penguin. And he's just running. And I hear this. And I go, Whoa! And I grab her tightly. He goes, She goes, What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I'm protecting you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what are you protecting me from? <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know. I don't know. He was running. I don't know. He was running. He was coming fast. I don't know. He was running. <laughs> and it, it fucks with me sometimes because it's especially annoying when I'm in bed. I'm living in a building. So in a building, you can hear noises, right? I hear a scratch outside the door, and it's like, I'm not, and I hear, and I go, she's like, what the fuck are you doing? I'm like, wait, did you hear that? <laughs> Shit that we always wanted to say as boys. Did you hear that? What are you gonna do? Like, let's say it's two guys with guns, what are you gonna do, naked Superman? <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> I will fight you with my dog. <laughs> what are you gonna do? <laughs> I still, I'm still a complete pussy in the dark when I'm alone. If it's one more per person, if I'm, if I'm with one more person, I turn into fucking Aquaman. I turn into fucking. What's his name? Leonidas from 300. I almost said Leonidas. That's how conditioned I am. <laughs> Leonidas! My dad would hear me smack the stupid out of me. <laughs> fucking Leonidas. Don't be a fucking cunt. <laughs> Leonidas. Sounds like a gay stripper. Hi, my name is Leonidas. This night would be fabulous. Las Vegas, my name is Leonidas, I hope you have a great time. So I turn into this goddamn wall of protection when it's just, when it's me and another person. One plus, right? But when I'm alone, alone, and it's completely dark, and it doesn't matter where I am, because it could be out in the woods, it could be my bedroom, doesn't matter. My mind plays this weird tricks on me. I'm sure it does to everyone else, and if it doesn't, then you're liars. <laughs> what happens is that if you imagine, like let's say you're, you're in bed and you have your eyes closed, if you imagine that there's a monster right here, like you start feeling the breath of the monster in your ear, right? And you're like, I can, I can feel something. I can feel something. And what you do is what I do, I suppose, which is I try to locate the light switch without moving, I go like this, and then I look away. In case the monster has night vision and can see where I'm looking at, realizes my plan, which is to turn on the light, therefore eliminating the monster, I look away. And then I try to get some distance with my legs so I can launch without the beast seeing me. <laughs> and I go, here it goes, three, two, one, boom! And I turn on the light, monster gone. And if she sees you, it's done. There's no more sex ever. No woman finds that sexy. No woman finds that this is impossible to find that sex. Plus, 
I have a little bit of extra struggle in the dark. I'm blind in the dark. I thought everyone was blind in the dark. That's the point of being dark. There's the, the absence of a light. Turns out, some people can see fine in the dark. My girlfriend is one of them. So, <laughs> I cannot accept that me, the man, the hunter, can't see in the dark and she can't, right? I can't accept that. It's, it's like hurting my ego. <laughs> I can feel it in my chest every time it happens. So, I get up in the night, let's say I want to have a drink of water. <laughs> and, you, you know, you get up, for the ladies, if you don't know the procedure, all the guys know the procedure, by the way. All men know this procedure. You're in bed, you wake up, you realize, I need to pee. So you find the line. The line is, the line that clears the furniture, so you can go in a straight line, from your bed to the toilet, in just straight lines. You can't do any of this, okay? Because that's too much. And I find the line, and I get up, I'm like, I feel, feel good. I feel stealthy. Stealthy. Like, no one can hear what I'm doing, okay? I'm like, okay. And I'm blind, so I go like this. <laughs> Just get the light, baby. I got this. I'm sleep. 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 Shit. Fuck. Just get the light. Hey, baby, just sleep. Just sleep. And what happens is that she can see. So she can see my retarded, naked ass going. I like doing that because I don't, I don't like taking myself too seriously, okay? So I like doing that as an experiment. There's a bunch of things that helped me not to take myself too seriously. One of them was my name. So my name is Alexis, which we all know what it means, right? Alexis, it's a Greek name, we know what it is. My surname is Pulidas, so let's throw that in the mix. <laughs> how fun it must have been growing up with that surname. How fun. We all know how nice kids can be in school. So, and for the ones that don't know what my name, my surname means, it could mean, it comes from the word puli, which can mean bird, or bird. Okay, for the Romanians, the same as pula, so it's actually the same. Aha, uh -huh. that's my surname, Mr. Dick. <laughs> I used to fuck with people, there we go, like, pulidas. Pulidas? Yes, two L-I-T-A-S, pulidas. Pulidas, just Pulidas. Yeah, my grandpa used to be a porn star. Pulidas. <laughs> um, so, when I moved to London, I was very happy that I was moving to a place where people didn't know how shitty my surname was. <laughs> and uh, I could finally live a normal life, just like anyone else with a normal name. Ah, but, my first name is Alexis. And there's a lot of Americans in London. Turns out that that name was not as innocent or as manly as I thought. A few weeks before I moved to London, I had bought a guitar, by the way, because I mentioned that I was going to study guitar, so I bought a really nice, expensive American guitar, and I called the company to get some details on the flight, and I said, hi, um, uh, I would like to speak to someone from technical support, a uh, technician maybe. She goes, uh, uh, yeah, of course, uh, I'll pass you on to Sean. Who should I say is calling? I go, Alexis. And she goes, <laughs> Right. I'm like, that was weird. <laughs> and I speak to this guy called Sean, very polite dude. But I was, it was bugging me. I was like, why? I'll look it up. How was that? And I looked it up, and it turns out there is a very famous porn star called Alexis Texas. She's a beautiful woman with big boobs and a round butt. Now, I'm not saying that my butt is small. I'm just saying, I didn't know it was a chick's name. I thought it was a dude's name. So now, I'm, I have to live with the fact that the place that I wanted to go to, <laughs> the, the, the cards are stacked against me, you understand? I'm going in on minus. I have a name, which is a girl's name. It's like being in Cyprus and saying, Marulla. 
You want to grab a drink one day? Me, you, Marulla, you? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's the same. It's exactly the same. So, <laughs> I found myself in New York City. Normally, when we do this in New York City, people go, woohoo! No, kidding, we don't do this in New York City yet. We'll see. So, I was in New York City with a friend of mine, guess who, right? Fucking Georgi from before. Yorgos, got checked twice, that guy. Uh, no homo, I swear. Me and George, just friends. So we decided to go to the States to see what the hell is this America everyone is talking about, right? We decided to go to New York City, then we said Manhattan, New York City, then Hollywood, California, Tucson, Arizona, because I've got relatives there, and then New York City, back to Larnaca. So we're in New York City, first day in New York City, I am stunned. We go to the front desk of this hotel, Pennsylvania Hotel, Fifth Avenue. Just making shit up, by the way, I don't know where it is. Pennsylvania Hotel, somewhere in Manhattan. Uh, like I know the streets, oh, Fifth Avenue, yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> and we go there, and our room wasn't ready, so we were suggested that we checked our bags and went for a walk. I said, great, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Let's take a walk, let's go check our bags. So we go to this basement, right? And there's this dude in the basement that checks bags. Now, it is very hard for me to convey the story to you without sounding like a total prick because this guy was as stereotypically black as you can imagine. I bet his name was Leroy, 100%. <laughs> Tyler, something like that, big basketball player for sure. So this guy was a very tall, very athletic black guy who had an afro with a fro comb. Mm -hmm. Do you have a boombox back there? What the fuck? What is this? Like NBA? I love this game. 23, Michael Jordan. Come on. You can't, like, come on. Uh, so I see this guy. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Fucking out of a movie. Look at him. He's just out of a movie. So I go there. Hi. I would like to check my bag. And I'm looking at him now like he's an attraction. Because I, it's my first day in New York City. Never seen this before. And I'm looking at him like he's an attraction. Hi, uh, we would like to check our bags. And he goes, hey man. <laughs> uh, hi, hi, uh, yes, the uh, two bags. He goes, yeah man. Uh, what name should I put down? And I go, Alexis, in this voice. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> oh man, I ain't even gonna tease you, man. <laughs> And I go, yeah, I know, I used to be a dancer. <laughs> and he goes, oh man, I ain't even gonna tease you, man. You know, my daughter's name is Melissa Alexis. I went, God bless, man. Check my bags, motherfucker. <laughs> so he checks our bags, we go, go around the States, come back 15 days later, same hotel, same dude. We're flying out of JFK next morning. I walk in with my friend George, he is with two of his friends. They're all sitting down, I can see they're all huge, okay? And stoned, clearly. Bloodshot eyes, guy sitting down, I wanna check my bags. And I go in, I go, hey man, you can yell it's our friend, it's our friend, it's our friend. Hey man! And he goes, hey man. I go, hey man, remember me? And he goes, no, man. <laughs> I go, come on, man, 15 days ago, like a couple of weeks ago, I was here with my friend, remember? We're Greek. Okay, I'll give you another hint, I'll give you another hint. What's your daughter's name? I know your daughter's name. <laughs> he goes, His friends go, ooh. <laughs> my friend goes, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. And I go, hey man, my name is Alexis. Remember, feel like a couple of weeks ago, if you remember, we we're here and that's uh, the joke. Your daughter's name is Melissa Alexis, remember? And he just goes, oh man, I ain't even gonna tease you, man. Thank you guys, you've been wonderful.
Oh man, I love that joke. I love that joke. Thank you all for coming out. First Cypress Comedy Central special, in the Casilla especially. I want to give a big round of applause to Irini for organizing all this place. These things are precious, man. These things are fucking precious. It's humor, it's laughter, it's healthy, it's contagious. How much better can it get? Right? And what I love about it, it's human nature. It's exactly who we are. However, even though as humans we have a lot of similarities, every time we laugh, we sound like our own version of retarded, right? Everyone has their own little thing. And what I like to do is every time I hear laughter, I like to associate them with something deep, maybe a personality, a characteristic of somebody, maybe deeper into therapy levels. For example, there's a lot of people who can't multitask. That translates. When they can't laugh, they can't breathe and laugh at the same time, so it ends up coming up. <laughs> and we're like, ah, clear! <laughs> or there's even worse, people who are like claustrophobic or agoraphobic, so every time they laugh, they need their space. So you see them, they do it all the time. I know a lot of these people are like, <laughs> like, Jesus, dude, okay. Or if we go even deeper into it, go to therapy levels, it's the denial phase. A lot of people have it. I've never seen it in laughter, but when I saw it, it shocked me. Where they do the exact opposite of what they're saying. So you say something funny and they go, that's hilarious. <laughs> So fucking laugh! It's part of the process. Why do you need to go to the five stages of whatever you're dealing with and fucking accept the joke? The other angle is the other one where they go, <laughs> That's not funny! Yes, it is! You're laughing! Deal with it! Deal with it! Here's a card. Go to my doctor. <laughs> Here's one that I saw in Cyprus. Where, or around, especially around the summertime, you see this with a lot of fitness focused people, people who really work out, and they know, they know for a fact, that laughing helps the core muscles. So they take advantage, and every time you tell them a joke, they go, <laughs> <laughs> They work all that shit out. And I love it, it's unique, it's personality. The other one is recent, my favorite one, I heard it in 2018. Girl didn't even know she had it. The Michael Jackson laugh. It goes like this. <laughs> and she didn't know. When I brought it to her attention, she loved it. So she started adding shit onto it. <laughs> their own version of stupidity. And what I like to do is I like to hear these stories. There's no other way of hearing people's uniqueness instead of just asking. And that's what I do. I love awkward situations. I love putting people in awkward situations, asking their stories and listening to what they have to say. And I do it a lot. So when I was traveling, I would do it a lot. You know, like on public transport, a lot of people, they sit on the train and they put their bag on the chair next to them so no one sits. Rude. But from my angle, it's a loss of opportunity. Because you can have someone sit there, but you need to make sure the person who sit there is fun and will have a story to say. So you can filter it, and here's the way I do it. Instead of putting my bag on the chair, I hold my bag, and as people walk in, I make eye contact, and they go... <laughs> and a lot of people, they get creeped out, like, oh shit, abnormal. But people who have a sense of humor, they go, cool. That's a joke, I'll sit down and I have the most amazing conversations. And one time I applied it, I was sitting on a train in the Netherlands. I see this guy walk in, unique. He looked like a white Bob Marley. Rastafari, baggy jeans, he's walking like, mm. and I look at him and I go, I go, oh, bro, that's funny. He goes, I want to sit with you. And I go, yeah, go ahead. You're comfortable. And I go, ah, thanks for the compliment. They're not mine, but I'll take it. And he sits down. I'm like, so what's your name? He goes, Biff. Biff. We are off to a good start. And I go, Biff, that's a unique name. 
is it short for something? And he goes, yeah, bro. What's it short for? Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I go, you American? Oh, uh -huh, yeah, that makes sense. It adds up. <laughs> and I go, bitch, if you don't mind me asking, man, you know, where are you headed? What are you doing? He goes, I'm going to work, bro. And I go, if you don't mind me asking, what do you do? What do you do for a living? And he goes, I climb, brother. <laughs> I go, what the fuck? Now, let me just cut the story short just so I can explain what Biff actually does. Now, some companies have really high skyscrapers, really high skyscrapers. And by law, these skyscrapers have to have a light at the top so the airplanes don't crash. And they need one crazy motherfucker to change that light bulb. And this is Biff. Okay. And I am excited. How often do you hear this story? I'm like, oh, let me ask you everything. How long have you been doing this? Do other people do it? Blah, blah, blah. And he goes, yeah, bro, I'll tell you everything. And we're just chatting for like two and a half hours. And then at some point, I get to the deeper questions. And I go, Biff, if you don't mind me asking, man, what happens when you have to go to the bathroom as you're climbing? And he goes, well, you do the poops before you climb, brother. That's like rule number one. And I go, granted, okay, I'm sorry. But what happens when you have to take a piss? And he goes, well, you better rain, man. <laughs> what the fuck? No, man, you spread your work. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going, are you, are you saying that you piss to the ground? No, no, man. Because technically, it never hits the ground. <laughs> And my mind is buzzing, because I'm thinking, does he think that it evaporates on the way down, or is he literally telling me that it hits people's heads, thus it doesn't hit the ground? Regardless, I am fucked up. Fuck you! Like, I want to kill him! And I turn around, and I'm fucking punch him in the face, and I go, and I look into his eyes, and I see something that changed my life forever. No, I'm not gay. Stop wondering about that. But I saw innocence. I saw pure fucking innocence. This guy believed what he was saying. He really, really meant it. He was not evil. He didn't even have an evil bone on his body. He was just a fucking moron. <laughs> That's as much as he knew. His education started and ended there. That was it. However, it changed me. It changed me because I stopped judging people on this shit. And there's a lot of stupidity. And we're in Cyprus, Jesus Christ, there's a lot of stupidity. You get to see it everywhere. There's so many versions of it. The worst type, I think, is when stupid people are stupid, but they think that they're smart. Because as long as, long as you're stupid and you know you're stupid and you admit you're stupid, at least you have self-awareness, so three points to you. However, there's a lot of the smart, stupid ones, if you know what I mean. And you'll see this in a lot of places, and it changed the way I see them. For example, queuing. If you stand in line somewhere, every other country in the world, the line is a straight line. Just this country, somebody stands next to you in the line, looks at you, and is like, okay. This is what we're doing. And I've changed the way I see this idiot. He's just an idiot. <laughs> of course. Of course. Please. Your parents are related. You obviously have an advantage. <laughs> or with driving. With driving, it's everywhere. Like, I used to get so mad, but every time you see somebody on the red light and he's beeping at the red light because it's still red, no! He's not an asshole. He's just an idiot. Very low IQ. And what I've come to notice and I've accepted is that, guys, stupid people, they are necessary for the smart ones to stand out. <laughs> but we're all stupid. I think we're all stupid, our own version of stupid. We're weird. Generally, as human beings, we are weird. And as time progresses, we're getting weirder. We used to be a bit more normal, but now with Facebook and shit, fuck it, we're gone. I think we're creepy. We've come to the point where we are creepy as people. And what we've accomplished is that just because everyone does shit, it's not creepy anymore. No, it's still creepy. It's just we're all creepy. Example number one, people watching. 
Yep. Yep, you're all doing it right now. I kind of feel awkward. <laughs> but the point is that we all do it. We go out, we sit down, we just stare at strangers and comment on their lives as if that's an acceptable thing to do. But we all do it, and we're all creeps. The other one is this story that we've been having for decades and it just keeps going. That every time, every year, around the holidays, this old fat white guy breaks into our house and takes credit for the presents that we spent half of our paycheck on. No, we don't all need to believe this story. No, that's not the point. Just the children. We keep it going for the children. You see what I mean? And we are creepy with that. Or the worst one, and I hate this, it happens on a daily basis, is the way that we talk to animals. Primarily women, the way that you talk to animals. I'm not trying to be sexist, but you know you do it more than men. You can look at a dog and go, oh, Who's a fluffy monster? Who's a fluffy monster? As if the dogs are going to look at you and go, Is it me? Yes, it's you! Oh, I knew it! And it gets worse. Oh, I love you so much, I want to bite your head off. Yeah, that's normal. That's normal. Oh, I love you. I want to take your ears and rip them out between your spleen and break your legs in the back and to turn you into a fucking stew. Oh! Fuck. I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. I don't need to get married, I just need you. Dogs now. Bow. Wow, this is fucking pathetic. <laughs> and I've had this happen a lot. Happened to my dog. My, my fiance's cousin visited last Christmas. She loves dogs. Instantly fell in love with my dog. Awesome dog, I don't blame her. But she would do the creepiest shit to my dog. Look at my dog and go, <gasps> Who loves pats on the bum? Do you love pats on the bum? Yes, you love pats on the bum. Now this is creepy shit. She doesn't see it, so I need to show her. And the way that I show her is I simply mimic, but I use my creep voice. And I go, oh, yeah. Who loves pats on the bum? Do you love pats on the bum? Yes, you love pats on the bum. <laughs> you sound like. Just because it's a different voice doesn't make it any different. You're a fucking creep. Get the fuck away from my dog, bitch. Don't fuck with my dog, man. I love my dog. I love my family. I love my unit. We're a small unit. It's me. It's my fiance, my dog, and my cat. And there's pretty much something wrong with all of us. My dog's deaf. My fiance has a short-term memory loss. My cat has a spinal disorder that makes her walk like a crab. <laughs> Hilarious. Me, I don't have a sense of smell. Maybe it's the big one, I don't know. But it's true, I haven't had a sense of smell for over a decade. The precious thing about it is that I love it so much. I love being ignorant to smells. You people, no offense, have a lot more problems than I do. For example, it's summertime in Cyprus. How much body odor do you need to deal with on a daily basis? Not me. Fiance loves it, never has to take a shower. Deaf dog farts, she doesn't hear it, I don't smell it. <laughs> I'm both happy. Think about the problems. My morning breath and my afternoon breath are the same exact thing. You know why I'm in shape? Because every time I walk into Zorpa, I don't smell the cookies. <laughs> the rest of you, you gotta have some honey, don't you? Yeah, you gotta have some. How could I walk out of here without them cookies? Not me. And I love this shit. It's giving me opportunities. It's giving me advantages. And I think it gave me superpowers. Because you have five senses, I have four. I'm forced to use my other four senses a lot harder, and I observe things in different ways. For example, if there's a smell in this room tonight, I can still tell there's a smell in this room tonight. All I have to do is just read facial expressions until I figure out where the fart came from. <laughs> but I can do it. That's the fucked up part. I can do it. 
I can observe things in different ways. And I have a lot of these stories, and I'm proud of these stories. One story, when I was walking with my ex-girlfriend, parentheses, very posh English girl, right? Where she would run to catch a train, and she would run like this. True story, very posh girl. We were walking through a park in London, and as we were walking, being ever so polite, she squeezed my hand ever so slightly. And I go, did, did you just fart? She goes, what? You did. You just farted. What? How do you know? What the? You just squeezed my hand. No! That's not the deal. The deal is keep them silent. No. I call you on your bullshit. And that's the point. The observation superpowers. Da, da, da. A Nosmic man. Or the other one that I fucking love is that I get to not smell your shit. Every shit. You know what I'm talking about. It's everywhere. Around the mouth of the poo. Every time somebody goes to Ayanapa, they pass by the cows. Everyone in the car goes, oh. I've never, ever had a smell interrupt my conversations. I just go straight through it. And I have a lot of these stories. So for example, I was in Brighton one summer, and I was chilling on the beach, and I was having my beard. At some point, I had enough beard that I had to pee. I had to break the seal. So I get up to break the seal. And I start putting my shoes on. First thing I notice, this huge-ass guy, 10 meters away from me, gets up, starts mimicking my moves. I put my shoes on, he puts his shoes on. I walk towards the bar, he walks towards the bar. And this guy's the size of a fucking mountain. I go, fuck, what the fuck is this now? I am in Brighton, what's going to happen? And I'm walking towards the bar, he walks behind me. I enter the bar, he enters the behind me. I go down the stairs and he hits an invisible wall at the top of the stairs like... And I go, fuck, this is my chance. And I go into the bathroom and I start pissing at the urinal and I hear... And he walks in like... And he's mad and he's looking at me. I'm like, oh shit. I'm about to get murdered. And he starts undoing his fly. I go, oh, shit, maybe it's not murder. And he'll just start peeing. And he comes up to me and he goes, <laughs> and I go, dude, what? And he goes, mate, how can you stand this? And I go, what? He goes, how can you stand this smell? And I go, oh, well, I'm actually immune. I don't have a sense of smell, so I can't pick up on anything. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he goes, oh, I must describe it to you. As if I thought I was getting away with anything. And he goes, oh, it's a punching combination of shit and piss and vomit and semen. And I'm impressed at this point, but that's a good nose. And I go, that's a good nose. He goes, fuck you, fuck you. I can't even wash my hands. I gotta get the fuck out of here. He just runs out with his dick hanging out. It's pretty disgusting. But I get away with it and I love it. I love it now. I haven't always loved it. I mean, it's been a while, but when this first happened to me, I wanted to get it back. Makes sense? That's why I went to the doctors. And I said, hey, doc, I don't have my sense of smell. What can we do? Is there a therapy? And he goes, yes, what's it called? Cortisone. If you don't know what cortisone is, it's a very powerful drug with very powerful side effects. I took a lot of cortisone. Syringe, pills, nasal spray. I got my sense of smell back. One side effect is that I started to lose my fucking mind. Every thought I had was blurred with emotion. Everything that I was doing was overly sensitive and vulnerable. You couldn't say anything to me without me getting offended. Everyone was an asshole all of a sudden. And it was just me taking this shit personally. And I couldn't understand what was happening because I was in this cloud all the time, until my fiance figured it out. She looked at me one day and went, you know what? I think you're on your period. <laughs> and I go, is it because I'm fat? <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, I got you. But she was right. I was blurred all the time. Ladies, I understand. I feel so bad, but I understand. Fellas, please feel bad for them. There's not one single thought that they can make without it being blurred by something else. It's a complete combination of emotion and thought all the time. You can never actually say what's on your mind in the words that it is in your mind. So you end up going, you know what I mean. 
and it was horrible and I hated it and I couldn't possibly think it would get any worse and then it did because my fiance got her period <laughs> and we synced <laughs> and it was double the sensitivity, double the vulnerability, back and forth, miscommunication oh my god it was a fucking nightmare I had one opportunity to be a lesbian and I spent it being a little bitch <laughs> I hated it. I fucking hated it. I said, fuck this. I don't even recognize myself anymore. I spent hours watching cat videos. I would follow models on Instagram. There was so much conditioner in the bathroom. What the fuck for? And I said, fuck this. Stop the pills immediately. Stop everything immediately. I would much rather lose my sense of smell. I would happily, happily sacrifice the smell of coffee than to ever again have to spontaneously start crying in the car because a Celine Dion song played on the radio. I would easily, easily prefer to die in a gas leak than to ever again have to explain to my best friends that I wasn't hurt by what he said, but the way that he said it. And so I stopped the pills immediately, immediately. And the fucked up part was, ever since I picked up this microphone, and I talked about the positives of not having a sense of smell, my sense of smell has started coming back to me. And I don't know why. I'm not religious, but God is playing a fucking joke. My girlfriend hears the story, does not believe it. She goes, hold on a second. So you're telling me that every time you get on stage and talk about the positives of not having a sense of smell, you get your sense of smell back? And I go, yeah. She goes, you fucking idiot. Why don't you talk about the positives of not having hair? <laughs> Smart girl. But I love being bald, and that's why I love being bald. A lot of bald people in the audience respect, and I fucking think you agree with me. However, for those who have not lost their hair, do so. Lose your hair, shave it. Fewer hair, less problems. That's it. Get up in the morning, look in the mirror, you're ready. Five minutes, you're in the car. Wind, always your best friend, always. Never have a bad hair day. And I love it, and I have identified with it. And I love that. I love the day that I found out that I was bald. I know what you're thinking, those who aren't bald, wait, what do you mean you found out you're bald? Well, think about it. I look at the mirror over here. If I have hair over here, I'm gonna comb the five hairs that are over here until I'm bored. Somebody shows up behind me and goes, uh, <laughs> That's all you have. The way I found out was I was in the Netherlands, and I went for the first time, I got a job there, and I went to do my routine, get a haircut once a month. And so I go to this hairdresser, I walk in, let me get a haircut. She goes, of course, sit down. Sit down, click, 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 click. Five minutes later, she goes, we're done. I look down, there's no hair. She goes, I go to pay, she goes, 27 euros. I go, 27 euros? That took five minutes. Why is 27 euros? She goes, I'm sorry, sir, that's our charge. I go, fine, I'm sorry, I'm being rude. I asked for a service, I might as well pay for it. So I paid 27 euros. And I go, fuck it, next time I'm gonna try something different, I'm gonna try another hairdresser. And so I go to the same shop and I choose another girl. And now I try to chat her up and I'm making jokes and we're laughing throughout the entire five minutes, we're having a good time. And she shampoos my hair. Oh. And then I go to pay, and she goes, nine euros. And I go, nine euros? How come? Last time it was 27. She goes, don't worry about it. And you know what? Pulls out a card, writes something in Dutch. Next time, even if I'm not here, show this card, and you'll pay nine euros no matter what. And I go, oh, all right, all right, all right. So I take the card, come back next month, She's there, nine euros. Month after that, I go again, she's not there. Another hairdresser gives me the haircut, 27 euros. She takes the card, she goes, oh, nine euros. And I go, all right, all right. I can't believe it's working. 
this thing goes on for months, and I'm getting hyped about it. I start showing off, and one day we're talking with my friends about how to get girls. They look at me and they go, Taz, shut up. You don't know what the game is like anymore. You're old. You don't know how to get women. And I go, as a matter of fact, hairdresser story, 27 year olds, 9 year olds, all because I got game. And they go, shut the fuck up. Show me the card. I read Dutch. I gave him a card with pride, thinking he was going to say something like sexy ass motherfucker. He goes, you know what it says? Pretty bald. <laughs> Like a swan. <laughs> so from that day on, I started shaving my head. Obviously, obviously, started shaving my head, and it helped me a lot. It gave me identity. It made me stand out. It made me look at myself in less superficial ways. It made me deal with my personality instead of my looks. Because when I had hair, I would fucking bother with it. But now, when there was nothing to bother with, I actually went a little deeper. And it helped me, and it made me identify with myself on a deeper level, and it gave me a way to stand out. Because in the Netherlands, not a lot of bald Cypriots. <laughs> and being a Cypriot abroad has a lot of advantages if you know how to use it. For example, I got to make up my own name. My name is Tassos. Tell that to somebody and go, hi, what's your name? Tassos. <gasps> Tassos? No. Tassos. <laughs> Are you even trying? Tassos, Tassos, okay, forget it. Some Spanish guy actually thought my name was asshole for about a year. And he would call me asshole, and I would turn around, so I guess I'm an asshole. So I gave myself a name, and that name was simple, and it was sexy, it was Taz. Three letters, and it's got a Z in it. How better can it get? The simply bald Taz guy. I'd walk around, I had lines. You know that question people ask you where you go, so are you a tits guy, or are you an ass guy? And I'd go, I'm a little bit of both. I'm a task. <laughs> and it helped me stand out, it really helped me stand out, gave me a very unique identity. I was the crazy bald Cypriot named Taz. Now obviously you can't do that in Cyprus because there's a lot of crazy bald Cypriots. So you can't really stand out. But when I was out there, I really took advantage of it. And it really gave me a lot of opportunities. I went traveling a lot as a trainer. And in one case, I went to Luxembourg as a senior trainer. I got paid good money for like three days just because of this. And I'd go in and my job was to train people, but I'd also have to train like junior trainers because it was their first time. And there was this one point, it was a very international conference, where we were about to enter into the seminar room. And before we enter, I go, okay guys, hold on a second. We need to talk. There are over 52 nationalities in this room. And I need you guys to be culturally sensitive. Do you understand me? Culturally sensitive. Just because they look Chinese doesn't mean they are Chinese. And they go, okay. Take the time, read the name tag. It's got a country on it, it's got a name on it. Educate yourself and then start the conversation. Okay, okay. We walk into the room, second I walk into this room, two Asian guys in the corner do this. And I go, fuck this, and I walk over to them. I go, hey guys, what's up? I'm the guy you're pointing at. What do you have to say? And he goes, uh, 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 you look like a uh, Vin Diesel. I go, fuck this, what? Bald, man boobs, Vin Diesel? I'm worrying about cultural sensitivity and warning the junior trainers, and now this guy's calling me Vin Diesel. I'm like, oh, very funny. Like, oh. You know who you look like? Who? Who? Him. I go, fuck this. Are we all racist? Seriously, everywhere you go, it's just racists. Racists from different countries, so they're racist with some other country. And I go, if that's the case, fuck it, I'm coming back to my races. Coming back to Cyprus. And so I started thinking of actual, plausible, feasible ways to come back to Cyprus. And I would ask people, I'd come over the summertime, I'd ask people, Hey man, what's your favorite part 
about being in Cyprus? Is it, the, what is it? Is it your job? What do you love about being here? And I got one of these. <sighs> hey, my friend. Hey. Hey. Let me tell you, hey. Don't tip the guts, hey. 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 Let me tell you, hey. Go, go, I go, I go, I go, I go, I go, I Hey, this is the only country in the world, right, that you can park your car outside of the Meritero. Meritero, the Meritero. Hey, Meritero, I'm a kiosk. Kiosk, right? You park your car outside of the kiosk. You buy cigarettes, you come back, the car is still there, right? It's still on, right, with the air conditioning and everything. And I go, so you're saying low crime. Is that what you're saying? Right? Zero, zero crime, right? There is nothing. Right, you go, you come back, two cars, right? That's what you find. And I go, okay, all right, I'll keep an open mind. He's making a good point. He's an idiot, but he's making a good point. So I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. So I come back, I take my car, I go to the kiosk, <laughs> park, I leave it running, I go inside. I buy the cigarettes, I come back, car's still there. I sit in it, keys are still there. Air conditioning still running. And I go, no shit. And I start thinking to myself, wow, is this enough of a reason? Is this like seriously enough of a reason to come back to Cyprus to make the whole change and come back? And as I'm contemplating, I think to myself, what the fuck am I doing? I don't smoke. I just bought cigarettes. So I just, fuck it. Just threw the cigarettes out and I just started thinking about it more seriously. And the reality is I came back. I'm here and I love it. My career is taking off. I'm engaged to be married in one year and I fucking love her. And she loves me back. And it's all about right now to me, it's all about appreciation. I got the sun back, right? And I got a good life going. And I like to show appreciation, especially to my fiance. And I think one of the ways men have to show appreciation is through gift buying. Not every single day, obviously, but you have to get something nice for her birthday, something nice for Christmas, your anniversary is a must, your first kiss, Jesus. And every single time I have to get her a present, although I love giving her the present, and I love getting presents from her, I hate the process of buying her the present. Because shopping for women is a nightmare. I think men agree with me. Women, if you disagree with me, that's why you don't have a microphone, and I do. <laughs> but the whole thing is you ask a woman, what should I buy her, and they all say the same shit. Get her something nice to wear, fuck you. Because you know that trap, you know exactly as it is that you don't just have to buy something nice, but you have to get it in the right size. And sizes in fem for females are not the same as sizes for males. Males, it's small, medium, large, extra large, pretty simple. But for females, it's small, petite, size zero, size 28, the Batman logo. It depends on the brand, depends on what you ate this morning, where you are exactly, what size shoe you wear, that, that size will vary. And you cannot get the size wrong. Because if you get the size for her, you get the present, and it's too small, she wears it, she goes, <laughs> I'm getting fat. But if you get it and it's too big, she wears it, and she goes, oh, you think I'm fatter than what I am. It's a dead end street, you cannot get it wrong, so it's a nightmare. And every time I would have to buy her presents, I got all the help that I could get. One time I was in the Netherlands, I had to get her a Christmas present. My mate Alex was visiting, I had her sister on the phone and her friends on WhatsApp and we're having this three-way conversation continuously getting feedback over and over and over and over and over. And now we are Cypriots abroad, which means no matter where we are, we speak loudly and in Cypriot as if we are invisible to the rest of the world. And we're going over and over through this process two and a half hours until we finally decide on a coat. And I go, we got the coat. Let's find that fucking size. And now what I like to do, if possible, is like to find a girl in the mall that can kind of look sort of something like her size. 
and have her try it on? Obviously you can't do this with every single thing. If you're going lingerie shopping, this is not an effective strategy. But it was a coat, so I said, fuck it. And I tell Alex, like, dude, we gotta find somebody in her size. And he goes, oh, I'm so high, just leave me alone. I'm like, come on, let's just fucking get this over with. Just find somebody. And he goes, what about her? No, oh, it's too short. What about her? No, 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 it's not, not the size. God, come on, we gotta get the fuck out of here. Fuck, just her, fuck her. And I go up to her and I go, and he goes, what are you doing? I can't, why? I have to fart. <laughs> and I've been holding in for way too long, but it's way too far down the tunnel. I can't risk this shit. It's gonna get out there halfway through the conversation. He goes, fuck, just go over there, fart, and come back. I can't, why? Because I heard that I dragged them with me. And he goes, just fucking take a walk, and I'll stand to scout. And I go, I come back, and he goes, oh. Second lap, go back around, say what? <laughs> go back around, he goes. <laughs> and I build up the courage to go up to her and I go, <clears throat> excuse me. She goes, Calispera. And I go, fuck this. <laughs> I gave her the coat and I had like, fucking gift vouchers this Christmas. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much for this. Thank you for coming out. because it's the first time we're doing this. So I want you to act excited. Who's your favorite? Beyonce? <laughs> Pretend I'm Beyonce. What? Oh, oh.